You're watching 12 WKRC TV, a new generation of news. 12 Newsmakers starts now. Good morning and welcome to Newsmakers. Two weeks ago, it began. Our newscast and the front pages of newspapers were filled for a week with images of demonstrators in the streets of Seattle. To an extent, that was certainly because of the underlying issues at stake at the meeting of the World Trade Organization. But it is hard to believe that it wasn't also because the demonstrations turned violent. Dramatic crash clashes between police and riot gear and protesters make great video. What happened in Seattle helped buttress an already strong cynicism that demonstrations, especially organized acts of nonviolent civil disobedience, are possible. Ten days before Seattle, on the weekend before Thanksgiving, thousands of demonstrators gathered in front of the gates of Fort Benning, Georgia, to demand the closing of the School of the Americas. The school is accused of training police and military troops in Latin America who are used to suppress dissent, including the killing of six Jesuits and their housekeeper and daughter ten years ago in El Salvador. This year, thousands peacefully crossed the line drawn by the police, fully knowing that they would be arrested, and then were loaded onto buses. In those crowds, over almost 100 Cincinnatians, many students from Xavier University, were, were gathered. Did you hear about those demonstrations? Channel 12 reported on them just once for about 30 seconds. Was it because they were peaceful, not violent? Sad irony, wouldn't it be? This morning I am joined by three of the Cincinnatians who gathered, as the Constitution says, to redress their grievances and to petition their government to close the School of the Americas. Gina Kohlhepp is a junior at Xavier University majoring in social work. Brooks Keishan, is also a junior at Xavier University with a double major, or maybe a triple major, pre-med, Spanish, Montessori, I don't know how many, and Jane Friel, who is obviously not a student at Xavier University, but a social worker in Butler County, also traveled to Georgia to participate in the demonstrations. Welcome, all of you, to Newsmakers. Uh, Jane, School of the Americas. Um, some people may know about that, some not. Can you flesh out the little outline I just gave why is this an important substantive issue before we get into the question of civil disobedience? Well, for me, um, the, well, first of all, the School of the Americas is one part of Fort Benning. And um, the, the School of the Americas um, uh, uh, trains people from Latin America. But um, as I uh, found out when I went to Salvador this year, many people were tortured and uh, murdered. Um, and many, they have shown that many of the, these tortures and mur murders were at the hands of people who were trained, schooled at the School of the Americas. Um, and that's, that's been proven in, before hearings and courts at this point, Absolutely. Right? They even have names. Um, and I, uh, since I went down to Salvador, I have become very interested in this issue. Um, it was the anniversary of the Jesuits, the 10th anniversary, and we talked to many people down there and heard their personal stories about, um, you know, about people missing, about people tortured, about people murdered down there. Um, in addition to that, the four church women who were murdered down there, uh, I, I knew personally knew one of, the, one of the people who was murdered. And having gone down there, visited their, their graves, talked to people who actually knew them, and talked to so many people who we never hear about, whose, whose uh, lives have been uh, totally changed because of the deaths of so many in their family, um, there was no way that I could not become interested in this uh, undertaking uh, to close the School of the Americas. Uh, <clears throat> one of the key elements here is that this was the 10th anniversary of the murder of the 10 Jesuits. Xavier University is a Jesuit school. Was that a motivator for you, Gina, um, to go this year? Definitely. Um, as a Jesuit university, um, we are called to be people of service. And it was very important for me in following in the Jesuit ideals that Xavier inst instigates and encourages among us to go down there. And um, there were other Jesuit schools down there in solidarity with us. And um, as a Jesuit community of students, we, we all collaborated together, which was probably one of the best parts. Okay. Uh, Brooks, follow up on that, <clears throat> that collaboration. I understand from reading about what happened at Fort Benning this year 
uh, major teach-in focused on the Jesuits, sponsored by the Jesuits. Mm -hmm. Did you participate? And yes, what happened? I, well, what happened was it was it made the whole event a weekend. And in that weekend, there were speakers, um, there was singing, there was solidarity with each other. And throughout the course of the weekend, there were different teachings, as you said. And these teachings went about two hours, and they basically explained exactly what we were doing in terms of you know, the laws that we were going to break and acts of civil disobedience if we chose to do so. Uh, they strongly encouraged that we only do this, not as an um, emotional knee-jerk response, but as something that we you know, seriously think through. Um, How long did, did, you, did that course go on or those, that teach-in? And how long did you really reflect on that? Did you know what you were going to do before you went down? I had been, <coughs> excuse me, I had been very involved with Xavier's um, commemoration of the tenth anniversary of the Jesuits, uh, their martyrdom in right. El Salvador, and I had been very involved with that for about two months. And and towards the end of that, when I was wrapping up, I I started to think about what it, I was going to do, whether or not. And so I think I probably put about two weeks into that decision. Okay. Gina, how about you? you? And you did, in the end, cross and, the and line. I ended up crossing and we'll the line. talk about that in a, in a couple of minutes here. What about did you? Did you cross the line? Did you decide to do that? And what motivated you to do that? Um, initially, I had decided not to cross the line. And, and crossing the line, just so I'm clear, that meant crossing a line, a police barrier line, which meant that you would be arrested and liable for prosecution. Is that correct? Correct. Um, the consequences included possible incarceration for six months and a fine of up to $5,000. OK. So you initially were not going to do this? Correct. And what swayed you? When I got down there and um, I listened to the speakers and I listened to the Jesuits speak about um, what it takes to actually make a difference, and sometimes it means putting yourself out there. Um, I decided once I was in Fort Benning, Georgia, that this was something that I had to do to, to take it seriously to myself and for other people. Okay. Were there some Xavier students who did not cross the line? Yes, there were. So these were decisions that in individuals could make. Jane, did you cross? I did not uh, cross the line. I, um, first of all, I, I knew I wanted to go down, and I had such a hard time getting down there. There was no room on the bus, so I had to <laughs> talk to my husband. Uh, well, actually, he agreed pretty. <laughs> graciously to drive down so we drove down and it was uh, but I had gone with the idea of giving witness and this was one little thing I could do I was certainly in solidarity with all the people who crossed the line I, I gave it some thought down there but I thought um, you know I really this is a process you need to go through you need to think through it's not something that you just jump into because mm -hmm. of the crowd and I had gone with the idea that I would give witness by my presence, and I felt because of my responsibilities at home at this point, I wouldn't cross the line. How large was that crowd, Jane? It, I heard it, the last report that I had heard was 12,000 people. It was, it was just amazing having you know elbow to elbow with so many people, and people being so gracious and so generous and so loving. I mean, these people were. It was a great crowd. And, and I also want to say that it wasn't mostly students. It was older people. You know, you <laughs> expect all the students to be there. But they're wonderful people, and they'd come talk with you about certain issues or, you know, anything. So this wasn't just go and have your say, but it was also, in a lot of different ways, learning education on a oh, lot of different levels for everybody, absolutely. for people who for were there. For two days, they set up booths with different social justice issues where you could go to each one and be educated on these things. So it was a real discernment process that they encouraged. Mm -hmm. Brooks, how do you think, what were you told? This has been going on. This is the ninth year for these demonstrations. Mm -hmm. uh, what were you told that the police, the military police, who would, at Fort Benning, how do you think they were prepared for it? Obviously, they were prepared, just as the Seattle police were prepared or thought they were prepared. Um, what were you told that, about their preparations, their expectations, and what they would do? Well, I don't exactly know what I was. I can tell you what I saw. OK. Uh, what I saw was the Fort uh, Benning police, uh, the Columbus police, were very nice. Um, they were understanding of the cause. Um, there, were, there were certainly a lot of activists that would go up to a policeman and, and talk to them for quite some time at in various occasions, and, and they would, you know, they wouldn't just, you know, push them away. The uh, police during, wouldn't <coughs> push them away. Exactly. Right. Uh, during the crossing of the line, they were very respectful of the procession that we were trying to do. Um, they, were, they were just, they were very respectful. It, it was not, 
it was not us against them mentality. It was, okay, now we've made our statement and now they have to do their job. But, but it certainly wasn't, it certainly wasn't this, it, it never developed into any type of mob mentality or, or us against them. Jane, um, a lot of the people who went, <laughs> the vast majority of the people who went to Seattle also intended to be nonviolent and were there nonviolently. Um, what about at Fort Benning? Were there, and some, a lot of the problems came with certain groups, the anarchists, and mm -hmm. you know, certain mm -hmm. people have just view that from a different mm -hmm. perspective. Mm -hmm. um, what about at Fort Benning? Were, those, were there those, as the press calls it, fringe elements mm -hmm. who weren't in sympathy with your approach, your civil disobedience approach? Uh, if there were, I didn't see any or hear of any. Um, there could have been, but uh, from my point of view, I didn't. I mean, I just felt okay. totally uh, so you in thought solidarity. So pretty with unified group absolutely. of people. Yes, Jean? absolutely. Sam, did you, is, was that your experience too? Yes, actually, um, they made us sign a paper, the School of America's Watch, who ran this whole um, operation saying that we would be very respectful, that we would not have any sort of violence, you know, demonstrated So there was an all. organizational structure yes. that was helping organize all of this. And they said, you know, if you feel called to um, be violent in any way, do it on your own time, you know, at another weekend. This is a very peaceful demonstration. In fact, we were even told to cross at crosswalks just to illustrate the point that we won't break any other laws except for this one because we're very mindful of the fact, you know, what we're doing. When you finally decided to cross that line, when it came to be your turn, how many people crossed with you and what was, what was going on inside of you? What was that experience? Um, the way they set it up is um, you stand five people across and I think there were 5,000 people who ended up crossing with us. And um, you each hold a cross with the name of a person who was killed by a graduate from the School of the Americas. And we saw a little bit of that in that clip that we had. Right. Go ahead. And no one speaks. There is just complete silence except for the beating of a drum about every three seconds, and they name one person who was murdered. And so it's, very, it's a very peaceful, mindful process, and it was very powerful. <laughs> Sounds oh. religious or paraliturgical to me. Yeah. It was. It was a very spiritual. I didn't expect to, to go for this, but I, it was a very spiritual experience. Um, there was almost complete silence in this in this crowd of twelve thousand people. You know, um, they they would name a person, beat on the drum, and uh, everyone would raise their hand and say "Presente." And ten people would cross the line at that point. It was just—it was tearful. It was—it was like it was a funeral procession. Uh, it was—it was a beautiful. And that experience. was the imagery. It was a funeral procession it was a for the funeral. people who it, had been and killed. Some funeral and some uh, um, caskets were 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 brought through it during the first 100. Um, they were different Brooks, sizes. Mm -hmm. Brooks, when you crossed, what happened? Well, basically, you have about three, four, five thousand people, I've heard many different numbers, in a bottleneck that you cannot believe. Because <laughs> the pillars are right here and everyone... The official gauge to the fort? Exactly. Okay. And it took about an hour and 45 minutes to get everyone across. Um, so, so what happens is you cross the line and, and they have the speakers, the speakers are pointing to the crowd. So they yell out the name, um, you know, Jose Okino Mero, Presente. And, and everyone's doing that, and then you're walking farther and farther and deeper and deeper, and it's and it's a very pretty base, you know, it's rolling hills, trees, very peaceful. And once you start getting farther and farther away, you can only hear the drum, mm. and you hear the drum, and then everyone still goes present, and they still are all raising their crosses, and then you get farther away, and people, it, it, it's just silence, and, and and I've never experienced that before. At at one point, I kind of cheated, and I and I took a little look back, and it, and it was amazing that I could not see where the line started, nor could I see where the line ended. Mm -hmm. and, and at that point, we were 10 across. So, because had, they hadn't gotten enough people across the line yet. I'm aware of time. What happened, Gina, after you actually crossed, committed civil disobedience, broke the law? What happened to you? I felt like, for the first time, I really meant what I always talk about when I talk about social justice and 
you know, civil disobedience. It made such a strong statement and really changed me. And I felt in solidarity with all the people that had given their lives for this cause. Were you arrested? And, you know, were you handcuffed? Were you, what, I mean, I, I think people need to know what physically happened. Um, <clears throat> you were told that you could get on a bus and they would drive you from the Army base two miles away and drop you off without arresting you. And if you didn't choose to either walk back by yourself or get on the bus, then you would be personally addressed and asked, will you please leave? If you refused, you would face uh, the consequences, which meant incarceration. And what did you do? We were the very last ones to decide that we were going to leave on our own. We walked back by okay. ourselves. All right. Brooks, did you do the same thing? Yeah, the, the Xavier group, because we had come all down together, and, and there was about 45 of us that came to Georgia, and 15, I believe, crossed the line. And so we had one van. So we all had to, it, it was all or nothing. <laughs> and uh, we basically decided that we were going to leave together as a group. And we did a recessional funeral procession. Okay, I'm aware of time. Jane, uh, we have about two minutes left here. Jane, what was accomplished by this? Well, I hope um, that more people have become aware of, of uh, the School of Americas because I feel like very few people really know, uh, are aware of the, of the issue at all. Um, I don't think there was a lot of press, like you said, there wasn't a lot of coverage, but I, I feel like those 12,000 people, if they spread the word and uh, let people know of their experience and what is really going on, I feel like at least we gave some witness there to what we believe. Very quickly, Brooks, if you also try to contact our congressmen, because there are bills in Congress that are working their way through, have you talked to Steve Shabbat, Rob Portman about this issue, or have people at Xavier tried to talk to them? Uh, people at Xavier have. You haven't personally? No. Okay. And final question here, Gina, very quickly. Yeah. Um, before you did this, or in, in the course of your education, have you read Gandhi? Have you read Martin Luther King on civil disobedience? I have not. Okay. <laughs> Well, some of us from the 60s <laughs> can still hold out hope and still admire what you did. Thank you very much for being here this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stay tuned. This week it was four children in Oklahoma shot by a 13-year-old classmate. After the break, I'll be joined by a local author of a new book on school discipline. Welcome back. School safety is on everybody's mind. What is the right discipline policy? Zero tolerance, case-by-case -case judgments? Tomorrow night, WVXU Radio will sponsor a town meeting entitled Zero Tolerance, The Answer or the Extreme at the Cincinnati Museum Center. The panel will be local, but the moderator will be the national public radio host, Scott Simon, and people from a number of other cities, including Tulsa, will be able to call in and ask questions. Joining me this morning is one of the panelists. John Lazarus is the superintendent of the Warren County Educational Service Center. He is the former superintendent at Norwood and at King's Local Schools. He is also the author of a new book. I love the title. Please don't call my mother. As a former teacher, I can say I've heard that phrase. John, welcome to News. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're in the, the whole country is very much tuned into the issue of discipline in the schools right now. In your mind, what is the key? What is the uh, key thing schools could be doing to work on discipline, to improve discipline, and therefore safety? The main thing is a t it has to be a two-way street between the schools and the parents. That's always been my number one item that I've stressed to people, especially in public education, that there has to be that line of communications between the school and the parents because without the parents' support, you're not going to have any effective discipline in your schools. And attacking the parents, using what we call preventive discipline, and having that open, you prevent a lot of things from occurring. What concretely can, I mean, as I remember uh, as a teacher, there are some parents, usually of the best students who don't ever cause any problem or academically working as hard as they can, who you see every time there's a marking period and you, they talk with you. Then you see, you don't see very often this vast group in the middle, and then you never see a group of people who probably are the parents of some of the most problematic children. It's easy to work with that top group. What do you do to get to that lackadaisical group of parents, or more importantly, 
to the group of parents who seem really disconnected to their own children. Yes, I, I believe you do the same thing with that group as you do with the parents who are really involved. And I, I have some proof on that. Uh, in Warren County, we started a school for at-risk children. And one of the things I told our staff when we first opened two years ago. Now, when you say at risk, what, what kind of students? These were children who normally don't make it in a regular school setting. They get suspended quite often. They get expelled. So they're, they're having discipline problems. It's major, not just academics. Major. Okay. And the discipline problems lead over into the academic problems. So when we opened the school, and this, uh, this school is unusual because we serve 10 school districts, and the way it was funded from private donations and uh, donations from our politicians in Warren County. When we, the first day we opened, I told the staff, immediately I want you to call those parents of those children. A lot of those children come from not the typical family situation. But I said, I want you to call, just to call them and let them know that, that you, you're their son or daughter's teacher and that you're there to help them. And you'd be surprised from those phone calls because our staff called them at night. It opened that line of communications. And this was the first time that these families had heard anything positive from either a school setting, a court system, the welfare department, children's services. So the interesting thing here is that teachers, school people frequently complain, and that's sort of the way I just set it up, that the parents don't come to them. You're saying... You have to go to the parents. The school has a responsibility. Right, and I, I believe that. And, I, and how I prove my point on what I just said is that we had teacher-parent conferences in October, and at the time we had 80 students in the school, and we had 60 of those families show up for teacher-parent conferences, which people in education and, and people out of education know it's totally unheard of to get that many so-called at-risk children's parents in. What concretely can you help parents, any parent, but let's say parents of children in a school like that, what can you help them actually do? Uh, I mean, yes, take an interest in a general way. Can you, take the, can you help them uh, communicate with their kids about uh, homework, with, uh, about you know, substantive, can you help really work with the parents or can you just communicate and encourage? No, I, you can help them. And by op first you have to open that line of communications. You have to develop that sense of trust with the parents. And what we saw, number one, is those parents, when we had to discipline a youngster, those parents support it. It's not a combative thing because most people, it's, it's, you would think in 1999 thinking wouldn't be that way, but educators and, and parents, it seems like there's a, it's an enemy between the parents and the, and the teachers. And uh, that's, that's, that's a thing we have to overcome. Yeah. And John, this concept of zero tolerance, and we hear more and more schools talking about that. Any breaking of the rules, there's going to be consequences, very strict. What do you think of that concept as discipline inside that school building? Not just a total philosophy, but you got to, you now got to run the school building. What do you think about that? In this day and age, with what's happened in, in the schools, as we all know over the last few years, my, my response to that is you don't fight cancer with an aspirin. And with the possibility of young people getting killed, you have to have zero tolerance. You have to have zero tolerance. Right, exactly. I will say that on the panel on Monday night, tomorrow night, um, that VXU is running, there will be people who have different points of view. But, sure. okay, so you believe in zero tolerance. Yes. Do you think that is working in schools that you see? And has it changed anything? I mean, are more kids getting suspended? I don't know if it's more youngsters are getting suspended or expelled, but what it does for those youngsters who might be on the borderline when they see severe action taken or there's zero uh, tolerance in effect, that I think it prevents a lot of those children who might be thinking of acting up or doing something really bad. One other thing, you're now out in Warren County, you've worked in Kings, you also work in Norwood and a lot of other school districts. Um, a lot of these incidents have taken place in sort of booming new suburban areas. That's the big difference. And why is that? I would say just, just the fact that today's society is a different ballgame than even 15 years ago or 20 years ago. I, I don't know if it has to do with youngsters uh, having too much available to them at an early age. That uh, I, I kind of compare it to when I went to high school, that the big things in our lives at that time when I was a student was to go to something that the school offered as far as a social activity. Uh, nowadays, uh, youngsters are, are exposed to so much entertainment and, and so have so many things that we didn't have 20 years ago or 30 years ago. I think that has a lot to do with it. Okay. And we're just about out of time. But I do find that a fascinating part of the discussion that these. A lot of these incidents are in these new suburban areas and not in the inner city That's areas. That's a big difference. And I think that needs to be explored. Good luck tomorrow night with Thank that you. discussion. Thank I hope you. it goes well.
for a more extensive and varied discussion of school discipline and safety, you might want to attend tomorrow night's panel discussion at the Cincinnati Museum Center or listen on WVXU Radio 91.7 FM. The discussion begins at 8 o'clock. Thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. Join us again next week and meet the women and the men who are shaping our city for the future.